I'm glad to see you all here. Um, we have Dr. Scott McLaughlin with us today, and I'll talk about his background in just a minute. But as usual, uh, two announcements. There are two announcements. Uh, first one about next week. We always let you know for next week, and we will be here again. And we'll have author Joe Citro, who will be talking about Vermont Bizarre and Baffling. Do, do you know him? I do. Yeah, okay. So we tried to get him for Halloween, but he wasn't available for Halloween. So that'll be next week. Uh, the other announcement, as we've been saying for the last couple of weeks, the program committee is meeting on Monday. It's coming Monday, the 22nd, uh, over at the library at 10 o'clock. You're welcome to join us. Um, if you can't join us, but you have program ideas, please either tell me or tell Edie or Bob. Um, I don't see anybody else who's in the program committee today. Um, oh, right, Lou is here too. Yes, ma'am. <laughs> um, or email them to Grace. And if you remember, you if you are a member, you got that email probably about that and about sending your ideas to Grace. Um, we do look at everyone's ideas that are submitted. We can't always get that person, but we consider every, every um, entry that we receive. So today we have the chase, run runners, the boat patrol, um, and Dr. Scott McLaughlin is here. Scott was born in Burlington, raised in Jericho. Since high school, he's been conducting Vermont archaeological and historical research, primarily as an employee of UVM's consulting archaeology program and the Lake Champlain Maritime Museum. In addition to working as an archaeologist and museum professional, Scott has taught anthropology, archaeology, education, history, and sociology courses as a lecturer since 2005. And Scott is now the director of the Vermont Grant Museum, which many of you know because he visited there and he spoke to us last year. And Vermont Project Archaeology, a professional development program for Vermont teachers. So please welcome Scott and welcome. Marge is also one of the volunteers at the Granite Museum, so thank you for your service there. So first I'd like to tell you how I got involved in this particular topic. Uh, working at the Lake Champlain Maritime Museum, we're fortunate to get a donation of a rum runner vessel, a uh, beautiful, beautiful vessel uh, that had been restored. Built in the 1920s and uh, was incredibly fast. And I just kind of fell in love with this topic. And then we were fortunate to have Merrick Carpenter who was a pilot aboard one of the Lake Champlain ferries for almost 50 years. And he had all kinds of stories to share with us uh, about rum running, because it was during the era when he started running ferries on Lake Champlain. Uh, and so, again, it was just a wonderful topic to share with the public as it came into the Maritime Museum. And then when I started teaching at the University of Vermont, uh, the history department said, well, would you be willing to teach the history of Lake Champlain? I said, oh, certainly. That's a great topic. I'd love to do that. Uh, and, but what I realized is that I only had some oral histories uh, from Merrick Carpenter and a few other tidbits. And so I began doing research in the newspapers and also a little bit in the court records. Uh, and so this topic, I just scratched the surface of. Someone, and maybe myself in retirement, uh, needs to research this in depth. Uh, it would be a terrific book, uh, as you'll see today. So in terms of the topics we'll cover, we'll cover the revenue, the rum runners, and the booze. <laughs> the three topics of choice. And if you've watched Ken Burns' special on Prohibition, uh, it's a wonderful, wonderful series. Do uh, try to get it. Uh, it's available on DVD. Uh, you can probably find one at the library uh, right here that you can take and borrow and take home. Um, but we'll, we'll just hit some of the highlights for our particular region. And some of it really does have uh, sort of a parallel to what's happening nationwide as well. The story of smuggling, though, is an important one to the Champlain Valley that doesn't begin just in the 20th century, but actually, in fact, goes all the way back to the colonial era. Now, if you have to think about, you know, you've got conflicts that are occurring between nations. Um, those are big, amorphous kind of things. It's hard to detect what's going on. And it's the people that are living in the Champlain Valley that are exchanging goods. And they may or may not realize that, in fact, what they're doing is smuggling by simply trading with their neighbors. Um, they, one happens to be on the French side of a conflict and the other's on the British, or one's on the Dutch and one's on the British. Uh, it doesn't really matter to those living in the Champlain Valley. They just need to exchange goods. 
They need to make uh, money, they need to get the resources in order to provide for their family uh, and their loved ones. And it's Whitehall, New York at the southern end of Lake Champlain and St. John's at the northern end uh, that ultimately uh, becomes part of the smuggling on Lake Champlain. It's not really paid much attention to at the national level, uh, not until the 19th century. And in the 19th century, we've got a conflict that's occurring in Europe. You've got uh, the Napoleonic Wars, you've got Great Britain and the French uh, that are battling it out, and the US is sort of just plugging along, you know, it's a small little nation, it's trying to do trade with the two countries, and they get caught up in it. Uh, and Jefferson decides, enough is enough. We're just gonna stop trading with both of you. <coughs> Well, that's a huge impact on those living in the Champlain Valley who depend heavily upon exchange between Great Britain and the fledging little communities that are developing in the Champlain Valley during the early 19th century. Uh, and there's no way they can stop that trade. Uh, it's going to continue, and that's why we have Smuggler's Notch. Uh, on Lake Champlain, the federal government will try to stop some of this illicit trade um, by actually building a small fleet of these gunboats uh, they're called Jeffersonian gunboats. Some are also patrolling the coastline as well, uh, all from Maine all the way down to Virginia. And the idea was that they were supposed to stop the smuggling efforts. Well, it didn't. Uh, it continued on. In fact, even when the War of 1812 began, it didn't stop the smuggling efforts. It meant that everyone still had to exchange in uh, Canada for their goods because there's no easy route to get to uh, the Hudson Valley. Uh, that's an overland route of 64 miles from the Champlain Valley. It was not going to happen. You could go almost entirely by water by bringing your products from the Champlain Valley to ports of Quebec or Montreal. Uh, you simply had to circumvent the falls around Chambly, which is about, between St. John's and Chambly, it's about 16 miles. Uh, and if you were fortunate enough, have high enough water, you could actually strap your material right to logs uh, that you turn into a raft and just shove it through the falls and hope it makes it intact. Uh, and pick it up at the other end. During the war, almost all the food uh, that was provided to the British soldiers came from the uh, Champlain Valley, uh, from this side. So Lake Champlain flows north. That's problematic uh, for anyone who's interested in developing an exchange network um, that's gonna go south. Um, but it also, Lake Champlain provides some great advantages for the smugglers. Uh, and it's long, 120 miles in length. Uh, it's got lots of bays and inlets. Uh, it's got 12 large tributaries that you can easily navigate good-sized vessels into. Uh, so you've got places to hide. You've got places to load and unload cargoes. Uh, and the population is growing throughout the 19th century. Uh, and what they're doing is they're producing agricultural products, wood products, and they've got to have an export market. And so why not use that navigable waterway, Lake Champlain? Well, Lake Champlain is part of a larger waterway route uh, that will develop uh, starting in 1819 with the opening of the first section of the Champlain Canal from Whitehall, New York uh, to about halfway, uh, somewhere around Fort Edward. And then it'll continue to expand until it gets all the way to uh, the Hudson Valley. 64 miles. Champlain Canal is completed in 1823. Uh, so now you can transport all of your cargoes south. The northern route, you could actually, like I said, circumvent those rapids if you wish, or you could wait until 1843 when the Chambly Canal finally opens up uh, and take your products directly by water routes entirely onto the Canadian marketplace. Well, once those borders open up, it means you've got all sorts of goods being exchanged uh, from Ottawa, Quebec City to the north, and all the way to Philadelphia, New York City, further to the south. Uh, and on those uh, vessels, there was often, yes, legitimate cargo, but then there was also illicit cargo as well, as tariffs are being added to various products. So you've got smuggling. Everybody seems to think it's OK. But you've also got happening at the same time throughout the 19th century, this idea that prohibition towards alcohol begins to increase in momentum. The first people that start to push the concept are those that are both abolitionists, but also are interested in temperance. They're working through the network of small congregational churches and other organizations to try to push their idea that alcohol is somehow uh, bad for society, it is sinful, 
uh, and they're building traction throughout the 19th century. And they begin to convince uh, state governments, both in New York and Vermont, and also small municipalities, to decide that they want to create dry communities. Uh, and so there are option laws that are uh, created in 1844 here in the state of Vermont. So some towns will be dry, your neighboring town will be wet. And obviously for the wet town, that was an advantage. You gave it a little bit more money. <laughs> Uh, so it's not really effective at stopping uh, the uh, production of alcohol or its sale within the state of Vermont. But it appeases people at the local level. Statewide prohibitions don't happen until uh, in the mid-century and are all failures. They never really made it off the ground. Who's going to enforce it? There's no real law enforcement. You have you know, someone in your community that might be serving as a justice of the peace. Uh, and they're not going to go after their neighbors. So ultimately, it's a, just a failure uh, right from the start. At the very end of the 19th century, we start to see greater efforts uh, you know, trying to put pressure upon communities to become dry, um, both with New York and Vermont. Uh, and again, still not really effective because there isn't the law enforcement behind it as of yet. We don't have state law enforcement. Uh, everything's still at the municipal level. In Canada, they're trying to also do the same thing. They're having the same effects of temperance societies, um, putting pressure on Canada, uh, and they actually decide to go nationwide. Uh, and uh, they find, again, uh, the possibility of being able to enforce it nearly impossible. And so they decide, it takes two years to make this decision, to go flip-flop from being fully prohibition nationwide to deciding, well, how about you guys, if you really want it, at the provincial level, you can enforce it. Because <laughs> we're not going to do it at the nationwide level. Uh, and Quebec immediately decides, yay, let's go wet. Uh, and of course, their neighbors are still dry, which means that all of the manufacturers uh, making alcohol in neighboring provinces, they immediately move to Quebec. And Quebec provides alcohol for pretty much the entire nation uh, throughout the uh, early part of the 20th century. Uh, and now, they start to place some restrictions, though, as we start to see the Volstead Act here in the state of Vermont putting pressure on uh, the province of Quebec. Since they're producing the alcohol, how do we stop the flood of alcohol coming into the United States from Quebec? And negotiations will be made between the United States and Quebec uh, to try to figure out how do we stop this flow. Uh, and much of it is just really ridiculous restrictions, which don't really do much. There's also other restrictions which have been here in the Champlain Valley, uh, and that includes uh, prohibitions on military bases. Uh, and that's something that occurred before World War I, but really no one paid much attention uh, until during World War I, they really clamped down. Uh, military police uh, actually looked for individuals who were intoxicated both on and off base, and they're reprimanded for that. Uh, and so you've got two large bases uh, in the uh, Champlain Valley, both of which had thousands of soldiers. And of course, they were drinking off base. <laughs> uh, they just were, they were fairly sober when they got back on base. The Volstead Act will take an effect uh, in January of 1920. Uh, and uh, it comes with some pretty severe penalties if you're caught uh, with alcohol. Uh, and at the time, a $1,000 fine, that's essentially enough to buy yourself a house. Uh, and so uh, it was a big enough uh, slap on the hand that most people would decide to refrain from trying to sell uh, or produce alcohol. Uh, but for those that realized that there was an opportunity to make enough money, that that fine really was insignificant. And so they started to push the system as much as they possibly could. Another thing that's happening is the fact that just by tradition, many households in the Champlain Valley produced alcohol. A lot of them, uh, farmers would have apple orchards. And why would you want those apples to simply to go to waste at the end of the season if you couldn't store them uh, as whole apples? Instead, you turn them into cider. And then over the winter, you allow it to freeze, uh, and you'll separate off. You allow it to ferment. And all of a sudden, now you've got a concentrated hard cider that you can take and use for the rest of the year. Most of these people are using shallow wells. Um, their water, necessarily, during the summer isn't the best. 
Um, there's a possibility of having uh, some sort of contamination of it. So you just add a little bit of that concentrated hard cider. It kills everything in that water, and it's just fine. Um, so the US government realizes it's not just happening here in the Champlain Valley, but all across America. There's a tradition amongst individuals, especially farmers, to produce hard ciders, wines, and even some distilleries uh, are in place as well. And so it makes sense you've got to allow home production for home use. But when you look at the numbers, 200 gallons? That's a lot to drink in your household. That's enough for every little kid in the household to have several gallons uh, a week. Uh, so there was plenty to, to go around to find some alcohol from your neighbors and friends and family members uh, in order to keep you supplied if you didn't produce enough in your own root cellar. And just to give you an idea of what the newspapers provided me as I searched through them, uh, so this is the Burlington Free Press, September 16th. Remember, it started in January, nine months earlier. And they're saying the persistent wetness up and down the lake is a condition by no means due to the water. There was so much booze flowing that it, it just, there was no way to stop it. Uh, and most of this is all coming out of Quebec from the manufacturers there of wine and beer. And it actually starts immediately in January. And it does so thanks to these vessels. <laughs> these ice boats, there's a great one at the Lake Champlain Maritime Museum. The thing is huge. Uh, it's like 24, 25 feet long. Uh, and uh, in the back, you can easily accommodate five people. Boy, you can also have one steersman and a lot of alcohol. Uh, and so you can imagine 10 cases of alcohol on this boat flying, at some cases, up to 50 miles an hour on the ice. Uh, you're going from St. John, Quebec, easily into Burlington, uh, into Plattsburgh, into the major communities, uh, and providing for those uh, speakeasies that began to develop uh, early on. But pretty quickly, the Champlain Valley recognized there was an issue, as well as for those uh, manufacturing alcohol in Quebec. And that was the fact that you had uh, wet communities in the Caribbean who were producing rum and other liquors uh, in vast quantities. You also had European countries like France, and Italy, and Spain producing wines. Uh, and it was nearly impossible to compete with the prices that they could provide, because they weren't carrying 10 cases. They were carrying tens of thousands of cases of alcohol aboard vessels, and they would simply stay off the coast just far enough so that they were in international waters, and the US government couldn't do anything about it. And all you need to do is just take a short boat ride for a few hours off the coast, pick up your alcohol, and then drive it right back. And so immediately, those in Quebec and also in the Champlain Valley realized they need to switch uh, their efforts. Forget out of liquor. That was definitely off the list. Focus instead on beer, uh, most importantly, and then secondarily, wine. Uh, and what you could also do is start to promote the Champlain Valley as a destination for tourism. <laughs> and you could take a day trip across the border into Quebec, get a little booze, and then come back to the Champlain Valley. And if you think about all of the camps that are created in the 1920s uh, around the Champlain Valley, most of those were all built in order to accommodate tourism um, that was coming from New York, Albany, uh, from Boston, all to come here to the Champlain Valley to have some fun during the summer. <laughs> and look at the labels um, that are being um, produced uh, for beer in Quebec. It's the biggies of today, Molson, Labatt. Uh, these are the companies that went from fairly modest beer suppliers to ultimately being the largest suppliers in North America uh, and continue to be king when it comes to quality of beer today. Uh, and so and without prohibition, these companies probably would have dissolved away, been consolidated, but unfortunately, um, for, or fortunately for them, they ultimately become king thanks to prohibition in North America. Just like our truck haulers, it doesn't make sense for you to take a product, deliver it to the destination, and then come back empty. And so, too, to the smugglers during the uh, uh, Prohibition era, um, they haul alcohol in uh, to the Champlain Valley, and they smuggle other materials into Canada, which were illicit, but also difficult to get within Canada, but easier to find here in the United States. Uh, and that included uh, things like uh, narcotics, silk, cigarettes, and cigars, 
uh, which were uh, in some cases legal. And then one thing that was certainly legal in the United States, 100% industrial alcohol being produced, uh, not here in the Champlain Valley, but in the upper Hudson, and then also along the Erie Canal, again, making it easier to transport that material by water. There's no highway system at this point. Uh, the road system is pretty poor. That alcohol can be turned into something that could be uh, actually used and consumed. Uh, and this stuff is pretty nasty. It would kill you uh, if you were to drink this stuff. Uh, it caused blindness and death uh, for anyone who drank the industrial alcohol. But you have to refine it, and then you turn it into something that's usable. In terms of the smugglers themselves, when you start looking at uh, the newspapers as well as the court records, you find out that they're all guys like this. Young guys who went through World War I together, they have just uh, saw some bloody fighting. Um, they have had their adrenaline just pumped uh, through uh, you know, the conflicts of war, and they're looking for that high that they received. Uh, and so they're interested in doing something risky, something daring. Uh, you know, they just saw their fellow uh, soldiers die beside them. They're willing to take risks that they otherwise would not have if they hadn't have gone to war. They're also, in some cases, unemployed. They're not interested in becoming a farmhand. Uh, in many cases, they've got no real experience uh, in any sort of occupation, uh, except as a soldier. And so why not become a smuggler? Uh, give it a try. Uh, and uh, for many of them, they find it very lucrative. It fulfills an internal need uh, for having something risky uh, and fills their pockets full of cash. In terms of others that are coming to the Champlain Valley, some of them are called vacationers. But in many cases, they only spend uh, the summer here in order to take and deal with the rum running, as it's called, uh, in the newspapers. But as we know, it's not rum they're running, it's mostly beer. Uh, and these tourists are often from New Jersey, uh, from New York, uh, and they're part of organized crime. These are people that don't want to remain in the city, where it's nasty, hot, dirty, uh, stinky. Uh, they would like to come to the Champlain Valley and vacation along Lake Champlain, have fun playing on their boats, uh, and uh, enjoy themselves as they drink alcohol with their friends, uh, as they invite them to come here. And there are plenty of examples of these dens of uh, smugglers all throughout the Champlain Valley. Uh, some are organized communities um, that have a single um, location, and others are like this one, uh, which I love. Uh, so it's called Rochester Point. It doesn't appear on any map. <laughs> there is no place in the Champlain Valley that has this name. Uh, and this was actually a mobile community. It kept moving around in order to make sure that no one caught them. And uh, what they did is they provided uh, a party location uh, that others would know about, except for uh, the, uh, the police. Um, they, they often didn't know, or they simply just simply ignored it um, because they may have been going to the party. <laughs> and at these parties, it was amazing. Um, they would have the best quality food, they'd have prostitutes, um, they did everything that people would possibly want. Uh, and they might spend a full week here and then disappear. And the whole community would dissolve away. And then it would move to a new location. In terms of the smugglers themselves, uh, some were down on their luck, uh, farm hands, uh, and just really just could not make a living uh, at anything they tried. They struggled. Uh, you know, this is not the, this is, you know, you're getting into the Depression era uh, as you talk about this era of uh, prohibition. And so some of them started losing their jobs early. Uh, and so this is one example, uh, Charles Muscat Robert. Uh, and uh, Charles was one of those individuals who just had really bad luck. <laughs> Uh, everything he tried, he failed at. Uh, and he gets his name Muskrat because of one evening where he was trying to take and get his cargo to his destination, uh, and he ran aground. Uh, and unfortunately for him, uh, he decided to simply abandon his boat, all of his alcohol, and swim for it. Uh, and uh, <coughs> there's cases like this over and over again. Uh, but for him, unfortunately, it led to a prison sentence and then ultimately suicide. Uh, he just could not, couldn't pull himself together. Uh, huge loss for his family and the community. Um, 
In terms of what was alluring them, well, I mentioned the soldiers, but there's also other things as well. Uh, some of these farmhands saw the fast money that people were getting. You know, they were coming around with brand new cars. Um, they were having the best quality suits made for themselves. Uh, and it was quite clear, everybody in your community knew exactly who was running alcohol based upon what they were doing uh, on a weekly basis. They were sharing cash with friends. Um, they were taking eating out completely. You know, don't buy anything from the store. Uh, everything was something that they would purchase. And so and it didn't seem like uh, it was that much of a risk uh, when no one seemed to get hurt. Uh, they seemed to be doing well all the time. Uh, and so for some, they saw the list over here on the left that it was pretty clear that there's got to be uh, a good reason that everybody else is doing it, so I should do it too. And when you look at the prices, um, they're able to double their money just by going a short distance, essentially 25 miles. That's all you've got to do is cross that border, get it to a destination like Plattsburgh or Burlington. Uh, and you know, if you could start to tap into the larger network of smugglers, you could get it to New York and make a great deal of money. Uh, and so there wasn't really much to prevent them early on. Uh, that $1,000 fine, the possibility of a six-month prison sentence, ah, you hire a good lawyer, they'll get you out of it. And that's what everybody kept saying. And they were right. For many cases, they often did. And the idea of making $25,000 a year, that's a lifetime's worth of earnings for a farmhand. There's no way you could make that kind of money. But you could do it in one year if you're a good smuggler. Well, when the Great Depression does finally hit, uh, it does transform the Champlain Valley. Uh, it means that a lot of people are uh, without work. It means a lot of the factories have slowed down. Uh, it means that the farmers are having difficulty getting their products to, pro to market. They can't buy their seed. And so a lot of the farms start being abandoned. Uh, and more and more see this idea of smuggling as the only choice if they'd like to raise a family in the Champlain Valley. But there are dangers, real, real dangers. Uh, and again, you can look at the newspapers and see those. Uh, in many cases, they're not reported. So uh, the ones that I do have is probably just a fraction of those incidents of things like running aground. Uh, and you know, the idea that uh, you could actually have a vessel sink on Lake Champlain. They're taking boats out that are really not very seaworthy. They're stripping them down to bare bones uh, and trying to carry as much cargo as possible. In terms of Lake Champlain, yes, there are navigational aids, but those aids are for commercial vessels, not smugglers. They're not going to help you get in and out of small little bays, which you're using for hiding locations. Um, they're for staying on the main lake, <laughs> staying out of all harm's way. Uh, and in terms of the boats that they're transporting the cargo in, they're motor boats. And this is early generation vessels of the 19 teens and 20s. Um, this isn't the, the high quality engines that we have of today. So the idea of one breaking down on you is probably pretty likely. So you've got to be a pretty good mechanic if you're going to take and become a smuggler. And this is something that many of them probably did not have. And falling overboard, well, that's a possibility too. Because <laughs> guess what? You're traveling at night, and you're traveling in the dark. And simply tripping over a case that's in front of you is very likely. <laughs> uh, and who's going to pick you up? No one. No one's out there to collect you. There is no Coast Guard. Uh, there's no one out there to, to look out for you, except for yourself. And there's also the possibility that you're going to get shocked, most likely, by another smuggler. <laughs> someone else is waiting for you as you cruise by in the middle of the night, knowing you're out there. And they'll just keep shooting away in the dark, and hopefully they hit something. And if you do get caught, there are those consequences uh, of the Volstead Act. Uh, and uh, one of those things that uh, happens immediately is that you're going to lose everything. Everything that's in that boat, uh, everything on your person, uh, that is all going to be now part of the US government's property. Uh, and they're going to sell it. And that's what this is. This is the Rouse's Point, uh, one of the sales that they had. People would come from all around to see what kind of products that were being sold, just as a witness to see what was being sold. Uh, and then, uh, in some cases, if you're a rum runner, this is where you go pick up your stuff. This is where you buy your boat back, your car back, all the things that were important to you, uh, and put it back into service if possible. Uh, in terms of the fines, they are pretty severe. And if you lost your load, 
and you invested everything you had in the previous uh, night, you may be stuck in jail for a long time because this has now become debtor's prison uh, for many of these folks uh, that weren't successful, like Charles Muskrat. Uh, and going to jail doesn't mean you're going to be local-based. They're going to send you to a penitentiary where there's murderers, uh, rapists, individuals that are pretty severe criminals. Uh, and you're going to end up in Atlanta, Georgia, a long <coughs> ways from home. Well, the Volstead Act is a failure, in part because there is great success on the part of some of these uh, smugglers. And so they up the ante. The fines went up to $10,000. So it tells you that something is happening. Um, they're making a lot of money, far more than other people thought possible. Five years of prison sentence instead of six months or one year. So once again, the risk is up, but there's still people willing to take and smuggle in the Champlain Valley. And they're pretty clever about it. The types of boats that they transport material in is wide ranging, trying to out, uh, um, outmaneuver both the, the law enforcement officials as well as other smugglers. So, nice little day sailor you see coming out of Burlington. They travel up to, say, Maquam Bay, cross over. Um, they spend a little afternoon there, have some food, uh, and then they cr come back. Uh, you've got ladies with parasols on the back of the day sailor. Everybody looks good and happy. Well, the hold is filled full of booze. Uh, but who's going to know, right? And there's a lot of other day sailors in making those same trips. Uh, you've got canal boats by the thousands that are traveling back and forth through the waterway. They are the tractor trailers of the 19th and early 20th century. They carry everything imaginable. Well, one of those has probably got a cargo, legitimate, and in the core of that cargo, it also has illicit alcohol. Uh, row boats, take a small row, throw out your fishing line. It's got a false bottom in it, and you bring it back. So. And if you make enough money, you can invest in something like a Chris Craft, brand new vessel. Uh, might cost you as much as you know, three, four hundred dollars. Beautiful teak decks, absolutely gorgeous boat. Uh, it's got horsepower, which is comparable to anything we have on Lake Champlain today. A thousand horsepower. That's the fastest speedboat that's on Lake Champlain today. Uh, they had this in the 1920s. Uh, they're buying uh, these beautiful watercraft uh, and using those. They're buying the newest of uh, marine technologies as well. Uh, they're trying to figure out how to make these boats fast, not for illicit trade, but people that just like to go fast on a boat. And the smugglers recognize, well, these are the best of craft because the possibility of evading someone is much greater if you can take and go as quickly as possible. So 450 horsepower, making 58 miles per hour on Lake Champlain. I've done 60, and it is scary. Uh, it's not something you want to be doing. I mean, they had it loaded with alcohol, uh, and so definitely not a friendly operation. And what's interesting to see is the fact that these guys that are running operations, they're starting to create networks all across the Champlain Valley, crisscrossing the lake. They know one another. Uh, they could be at different locations. Um, everything's all planned out. Um, they know where their destination is, where they're going to pick up, how much is necessary. It, it's an organized business. And some of it is organized crime, which I'll mention in a bit. One of those that was caught here in the Champlain Valley. Uh, and the amounts they're carrying on this boat, 93 cases of alcohol. Where they fit it, I don't know. But they probably strapped it to the deck, uh, everywhere you could possibly fit it. And this is what those beautiful Chris Craft are turned into often the case. It's gone. All that beautiful material, completely stripped, just so it could hold cases of alcohol. Uh, and this boat was actually one of the previous pictures, one of the beautiful vessels. Uh, 400 cases. Again, where did they put it? Now, you don't have that much deck level. Uh, stacked up as high as possible so that you get very little freeboard, maybe a foot or so, and you're still trying to travel at 30, 40 miles an hour. In terms of your destinations, most of this alcohol will remain in the Champlain Valley if it's carried by anything but a canal boat. Canal boats aren't going to unload a cargo anywhere in the Champlain Valley. They're going straight to New York Harbor. 
That's where their destination is. They're picking up cargoes in Canada, uh, often lumber, could be hay. Remember, this is an era of transition in terms of transportation. So in New York, you still have thousands of horses that need to be fed, and that hay is being cut in Quebec in the fields there. So it's the major communities, um, ones that are both industrial towns like Virgins, um, but also um, major centers like Burlington and Plattsburgh, uh, and rail towns like St. Albans, Port Henry. Uh, so this is where the alcohol is being consumed in the Champlain Valley in its greatest of quantities. That's your destination. Uh, you simply have to get it into port uh, and um, try to evade the uh, law enforcement that might be there. So uh, all these vessels, doesn't matter what uh, your, um, your type of boat is, you can ultimately figure out uh, a transportation route uh, and a type of cargo that's most lucrative for you. So here's the canal boats. These canal boats uh, were owned by families. Um, they're not owned by major companies. And everyone at this point, after the Champlain Barge Canal opens up in 1915, they own two of them. They work in consort. The kids are probably living in one cabin, the parents in the other, with the little, little ones, and here's their laundry out for the day. Uh, and uh, to lose uh, one or both of these canal boats would put them into bankruptcy. There's no way they could cover it. If you are traveling all the way to New York with uh, your alcohol on canal boats, um, then you're ultimately going for one of these speakeasies. But there are also many of them here in the Champlain Valley. Uh, all of your hardware stores, grocery stores, um, they all had a small back room, and that turned into their speakeasy. It's not like the ones in New York City where you got live music or something like that. Instead, you go in, you buy your alcohol, you chat with the owner, because uh, you've been friends for decades, uh, and then you take your alcohol home with you. This is a great technique uh, that, I mentioned, that I saw in the uh, newspapers, the idea of towing a log behind your boat. Uh, everybody would just look at it and think it was just a drift, uh, and, but then you realize it's actually following the boat. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, and inside that log would be filled full of bottles. Uh, you're not going to make a lot of money off from that, but it certainly would provide for you and your friends. <laughs> the false bottoms uh, in the small rowboats. Uh, again, just line the whole thing, roll it over, line it with alcohol bottles, and then tack on the bottom. And, yeah, the bottles are going to get wet, but that's not going to harm them. The idea of uh, you know, possibly getting caught meant that you had to find ways to uh, evade the law enforcement in terms of finding anything of incriminating evidence on board your boat. And so if you look at this vessel right here, it's been stripped. This is a Chris Graff again. Absolutely gorgeous vessel, no teak deck, it's all gone, everything, cabin. Uh, and what they've done is they put these three slats on each side, and they pile the cases right up on top of here, strap them on just enough so that they're not going to fall off overboard as you're traveling at high speeds, and then if you think you're being followed by a smuggler or someone in law enforcement, then all you need to do is simply tip these boards over and boom, all of your alcohol falls into the lake. But you want to recover that. You don't want to lose it. So you tie salt blocks to it. The salt's going to dissolve and you, the crates themselves are going to cause those bottles to float to the surface. There's a little bit of air in each bottle. The whole thing is going to pop right up to the surface. <laughs> and so you just need to collect it after the salt dissolves. And depending upon the size of the salt block, it might be 10, 18 hours later, they'll pop up to the surface. And you come get it. <laughs> Smuggling by canal boats, uh, well, you ran the risk when going through customs of them finding the material as they took these steel probes and shoved them into the uh, cargo. Uh, and uh, so it didn't take much for them to figure out as you push the probe in, you feel resistance all of a sudden smash. <laughs> it's like, uh-oh, we've got bottles. And they would force you to unload your entire cargo. And so uh, frequently they would require canal boatmen to unload their cargo if they uh, spoke up. Uh, and uh, they started to uh, give uh, the customs agents uh, trouble. And if you had to unload your cargo, that meant you might have had a delay of several days. You had to unload it by hand. There are no derricks or anything like that at the customs station. You weren't designed to unload cargo there. And so time consuming, you could lose a great deal of money on a shipment. So 
great story that I got through oral history. Since my dissertation dealt with the canal boats, which I investigated this, about uh, 350 of them on the bottom of Lake Champlain, I looked at about 225 of them, uh, and I collected oral history from people that lived aboard the canal boats during their uh, youth. And so Eda Mae Wilkins, uh, I spoke to, she was just outside of Albany, and she remembers as a child when, uh, during Prohibition, uh, they'd pull into Rouse's Point at the customs station, and uh, her mother would say, get on the potty, get on the potty. So they'd pull out the potty from underneath the uh, bed, and she'd sit right in the very middle of the cabin. Uh, and the cabin's here at the stern. The customs agent would come down the companionway, and she'd be sitting there with a little dress over top of the potty, and she'd stare at the customs agent, and as he walked around the cabin, she'd follow him. <laughs> and then he'd leave after looking through all the cupboards, flipping over mattresses, and she couldn't figure out, she kept telling her mother, I don't have to go potty. And she said, doesn't matter, sit on the potty. Well, it wasn't until she got to her teenage years she found out that her father was smuggling alcohol below the deck of the cabin, and guess what, the hatch was right underneath the potty. <laughs> so she had to do that for, she said, many years, and when she got pretty old, she was like, I definitely don't want this man watching me sitting on the potty, but she said she had to sit on the potty. <laughs> so right here in the middle of the cabin, they'd often have some sort of hatch uh, in order to get below. There's a three foot uh, difference between the cabin level and the bottom of the hold, and that would be completely filled full of alcohol. And that would be a little extra money that her father could make in order to tie it over the winter, uh, because they obviously couldn't travel when you have ice on the lake and the canals. And so they needed that little extra money so they could survive while they lived in port. In terms of law enforcement, the revenuers, well, an entire structure had to be created in order to prevent some of the smuggling. And some of it was at the federal level, some of it was at the state level. And so at the federal level, you've got customs officers were told that, well, you have to take and police them. Well, the customs officers were way too busy doing other paperwork. Uh, now the customs station at Rouse's Point in St. Albans was super, super busy, uh, and there was no way they were going to take and deal with alcohol. It just was not something they wanted to deal with. So they, they sort of refused. Uh, the Border Patrol, which was supposed to monitor the people crossing, well, they had to deal with, oh, you know, pull up your pant leg, let's see what you got strapped to your leg. Uh, well, you got a really poofy dress today. Uh, go to the back room, flip over your dress, the lady is going to follow you and see what you got. Uh, and so you know, Border Patrol would do a little bit, but they weren't interested in anything that was happening on the lake. That's something different. Prohibition agents were hired in order to patrol the entire border region just looking for those smugglers. And it wasn't until the Marine Boat Patrol was established on Lake Champlain that finally someone would be out there looking for smugglers that were using the waterway itself. At the state level, the state police of New York had been developed just before uh, Prohibition. And so they didn't, want to, they didn't want to deal with federal laws. They weren't interested in that. But unfortunately for them, the state of New York would be pressured by the federal government to develop their own uh, Prohibition Act, like the Volstead Act. County sheriffs, again, they weren't interested. Uh, they, they had other things to deal with. Uh, and any of the municipal police and town constables, they were dealing with people having arguments over who stole the chicken. Uh, or, you know, my fence got knocked over by your cow. Uh, again, they weren't interested in getting involved in alcohol. They didn't want to take and uh, get neighbors upset about them. And um, they were more interested in just keeping the peace in their community. In terms of New York's law, it was called the Mulligan Gage Law. Uh, and it was pretty short lived, 26 months. And it turned out to be a dismal failure, much like other prohibition laws. Uh, and, um, and the reason why is because they got 445 miles of border in order to patrol. Uh, and there was no way. Most of it was wooded, small dirt tracks, a lot of uh, people that lived literally right on the border itself. Uh, their house was split right in half by the border. Uh, they had farmland on one side, farmland on the other side. They had tracks running back and forth through fields. There was no way you could patrol all of that. It was impossible. Uh, and so. Now, they tried their best with what modes of transportation were the fastest and easiest to move around at the time, uh, the motor car and the motorcycle, uh, and then often by horse as well. Canada got roped into uh, you know, 
trying to stop the flow of alcohol by pressure from Washington. Washington tried to convince the Canadian government that they were responsible for that flow of alcohol. And they were like, well, it's your act, not ours. And they did that as long as they possibly could. So from 1920 to 1924, they did the best they could to sort of just refuse to uh, uphold any of the Volstead Act uh, or the Jones Act. And, but finally, um, the, um, they would agree to just giving some idea to the customs agents and others in the US uh, that there were, might be some alcohol coming your way. <laughs> that wasn't enough, because it usually came about 12 hours too late. <laughs> and then finally in 1930, um, there was a treaty agreement that was signed by Canada and the United States and said, okay, fine, we will stop the alcohol flow as best we can. We can't promise anything, um, but uh, we will do our part. In terms of the customs agents uh, and um, the, um, those responsible for stopping the flow, uh, as best they could at the federal level. They're at Rouse's Point in St. Albans, and St. Albans is nowhere near the border. Uh, it is a long ways into the interior. There's no way they could actually take and do much to stop it. Uh, and if it was flowing on Lake Champlain, they couldn't do much because they're in the inland uh, sea area. They're way off to the east of the main channel uh, where alcohol is mostly flowing. And Rouse's Point, again, not necessarily the most convenient spot. Uh, it's also way too far into the interior. In terms of Lake Champlain, it really was an open season right till 1922 until the Marine and Boat Patrol was established. Uh, and when it was, uh, it was pretty difficult to do because there were literally thousands of small boats on Lake Champlain. Uh, and any one of them could be traveling with alcohol aboard. But when it was established in 1922, it was a pretty small force considering you have a massive uh, body of water in which to patrol. Uh, and it was uh, put together by uh, John Jack Kendrick. Uh, he was a veteran of World War I, uh, and he was sitting at the border. Many of these soldiers were given jobs to work at custom stations uh, or border patrol stations, uh, or there were post offices. Uh, and he was just bored to tears. He's a 20-something year old. Uh, he just did not want to sit there and watch people cross the border maybe four or five times a day as they took their cows back and forth. Uh, and so when someone gave him the opportunity to be on Lake Champlain, he's like, yes, get me out of this place. Uh, and he immediately went to his mother who had a, a cottage on Lake Champlain in Colchester and said, mom, can, can I use our dock and our boat? Uh, and she said, sure, okay, all right. Uh, and so he had just put together a force of his own. And so he went around uh, and he picked up other guys that were from World War I, veterans. And then he also decided to pick on this gentleman, uh, Armin Levine, uh, nicknamed Midget. Uh, he was an amateur boxer, short guy, but a massive punch. He's like, this is my bulldog. <laughs> this is the guy that's going to help me. Uh, knowing that he's going to have to take and approach a boat, and he's going to need a bulldog to make sure things stay under control. And then he needed people that he could trust. He knew he could trust former soldiers, um, but he needed someone else to fill out his rank. So he went right to UVM, and he went to uh, the best students he could possibly find. And he also decided medical students, they would be helpful. <laughs> At least something does happen. Uh, and Bradley was one of those medical students um, that was with him for quite some time. They got their federal uniforms. Um, the U.S. government bought them a couple of watercraft, but this one actually is his mother's. Uh, and they started at this dock right here in Mallet's Bay. Uh, the problem is that it's well into the interior. It's a tough one to get out to the Broad Lake. So it takes a while, though, in order to get him uh, convinced, as well as the federal government, that another station uh, might be more advantageous for them. So where do they go? They go to the Albert Rouse's Point Railroad Bridge. Here's a little shack. Uh, where the operator was sitting. And in there, um, there was also some spare rooms, which they used for his entire crew. Uh, as they went out, every night, they would leave from here. This is the broad lake. This is where everybody has to go through if they're coming from Canada, uh, from uh, you know, places like the Bucket of Blood and other bars right on the Richelieu River. And in terms of what he was able to do, it's fairly restrictive. Uh, the federal government told him that he could take and uh, search any vessel that was still on the water. But if that case of alcohol was sitting on land, he couldn't touch it. He could only uh, go after it if it was on the boat. 
and he could search any vessel that he wanted to because he was not only upholding uh, the laws of prohibition, but he was also upholding laws that dealt with navigation on Lake Champlain. That'll be important in a few minutes. <laughs> uh, so a lot of these guys that were smuggling, they were trying to create transfer stations. Every little farmstead that they could possibly find on Lake Champlain, they would take an outbuilding and they'd put it right on the lake. <laughs> they put it right down to the waterfront's edge, and if they could get their boat there as quickly as possible, unload the cases, uh, within an hour, those cases would be gone before law enforcement was able to get to that little shack. In terms of seizures, uh, most of those seizures were uh, ones that were pretty small on Lake Champlain uh, and even along uh, the border region as well. Uh, and for many, they were just let go. So if you're crossing the border at a walking crossing, you know, if you had a flask in your pocket, they just take the flask from you and say, go away. Uh, same thing on Lake Champlain if you're a day sailor. You had two or three bottles, oh jeez, give me the bottles and go. Uh, and that would be about it. Uh, again, the idea was to stop the flow of alcohol and not upset the, those in the Champlain Valley. In terms of the boat patrol craft, well they realized that they were going to need faster and faster boats. Well, they had the boats that they seized. Remember this one? That's the same boat. Isn't that sad? Uh, just strip it right down. And that's Old Pops. Uh, and this is Flopsy Jane. And this one also, she'll get stripped down to her bare bones at some point. Uh, unfortunately, the federal government, during Prohibition, uh, it's during the height of the Depression, they want money. So they force them to sell these vessels uh, after the season's over with. And who buys them? The smugglers. <laughs> In terms of the Canal boats, um, no doubt there were many, many boats that were carrying alcohol. Uh, and uh, some of them were captured uh, at Rouse's Point by the customs agent. And here's one really tragic story uh, of one where um, they captured the vessel. 94,000 bottles of ale were found uh, on board. And the captain was thrown into jail along with his wife and his children. And then his wife and children were paroled. They were uh, paroled to someone in the community at Rouse's Point. They lost everything, all their belongings. And dad, guess where he was sent? Georgia. So uh, it left the entire family destitute. They had no place to go. Uh, and so they probably went to a poor farm someplace in upstate New York. And that's probably where the kids were raised. While well, their father spent uh, quite some time uh, in prison. And in terms of the alcohol that was captured in the article, uh, it said that uh, everybody in town was concerned uh, about the fish that they were capturing along the Brasses Point Pier. It's like, this is a lot of booze. Am I going to get drunk drink, eating this fish? <laughs> Am I going to get arrested for eating this fish uh, if he is drunk? Uh, so there were a lot of comical things in the newspaper. People just didn't realize what was going on. Um, in terms of the cooperation that was taking place in the Champlain Valley, as prohibition continued on into the 1920s, greater and greater effort was had to try to create this cooperative effort amongst individuals across the lake. And uh, a lot of them uh, were buying these faster boats, taking greater risk, and some of them were trying to attack other smugglers that were on Lake Champlain. That meant there was a greater risk of harm uh, to not only smokers, but also to the boat patrol. And here's an example of uh, sort of the increased level of recognition that Lake Champlain would be an important corridor for large sources of alcohol, especially for organized crime in the New York City metropolitan area. So Snyder is one of those individuals uh, from New Jersey. Uh, he vacationed at Maquam Bay uh, and uh, he decided that uh, he was going to take and have a boat designed just for him, and this is what it looked like. This is another one very similar to it. These were made uh, by a marine uh, outfit in New Jersey. It's got two Liberty engines coming right out of the airplanes from World War I. They're stacked back to back. 1,000 horsepower this thing had. Uh, it was reinforced uh, hull in order to withstand the speed at which it was slamming against the waves. Uh, both on the, and this is good for both uh, on Lake Champlain, closed water, uh, compared to the shorelines of New Jersey and New York going out to Long Island. Uh, and so this is, was his playbook. 
he drive from Maquam Bay through the islands all the way up the Richelieu to bars like uh, the Bucket of Blood, uh, and uh, he'd get drunk, load a few cases of booze into his boat, and then head back to his camp at Maquam Bay. Well, uh, Kendrick decided that he was done with this guy. Uh, he'd been zipping through uh, the Rouse's Point Bridge uh, for quite some time, and he wanted to capture him. But every time he cruised through, he seemed to have someone there that understood that uh, Snyder was on his way home. And he couldn't quite figure out what was going on, um, but he decided there's got to be some way in which to stop this guy. So what he decided one night is that he was just simply going to follow him all the way home. He knew where he was headed, and he knew he couldn't catch up to him. So he just kept plodding along, going through the islands with his fairly fast boat, um, but eventually getting to Maquam to his dock, parking his boat, and uh, the guy he was with, uh, Fate Templeton, uh, that night, was wondering, well, how are you going to take and arrest him? How? The alcohol is going to be gone. There's nothing you can do about it. <coughs> He's also upholding all other federal laws, including navigation laws. So he pulls out his book, and he starts taking notes. He was running with no navigation lights, Snyder was. He had no handbook. He had no life jackets. Uh, <laughs> So it was this long litany of um, things that Snyder was violating in terms of federal laws. It had nothing to do with prohibition. And so he walks up to Snyder, and Snyder says, you, you can't do anything to me. And he asked him to turn around. He put him in chains, and he hauled him to St. Albans and threw him in jail. And he explained to them why he was arresting him. And he said, well, I'm getting out of here as fast as I possibly can. Well, uh, the uh, judge refused uh, to go to the courthouse that night, so Snyder had to spend the night in jail. Snyder had been uh, a smuggler out of New Jersey right from the beginning of Prohibition. Uh, and this is almost nine years later that he's captured. And so Snyder had evaded the federal government who had been trying to get him for nine years. Kendrick got him, <laughs> <laughs> threw him in jail, and made him humble, uh, at least for that night. And so as soon as he gets out, what does he do? He buys his boat back. <laughs> Snyder and others recognized that the boat patrol was getting a bit more savvy about their operations on Lake Champlain. Uh, and there'll be some pretty serious incidents that will take place at the end of Prohibition. And one will involve uh, our Mr. Midget here, uh, Armin Levine, uh, and another one, uh, Lawrence I Izzard. Uh, the two of them were sitting at uh, the Rouse's Point Bridge. Uh, and they realized that every time they went to go and get it, a snack, eat a meal, just sit down uh, and not be paying attention to the water, all of a sudden a boat would go flying through the Rouse's Point Bridge. It's like, how can that happen? You know, every single time they sat down, a boat would go flying through. They realized that it must be the operator for the bridge, which is a swing bridge for the railroad. He's in on this. He's alerting um, the smugglers that um, they are uh, sitting inside and they're not paying attention. And so what they did is they sneak up, and sure enough, uh, they watch him switch the lights. He's flashing the lights uh, so that the smugglers know that the bridge is open, come on through. <laughs> the coast is clear. Uh, and so they decide that that night what they would do is stretch some ropes between the piers. <laughs> they know that the commercial craft are not out there. It's the middle of the night. Uh, they know that the pleasure boats are not out there. Uh, it's the middle of the night. And if they've got running lights, they'll see them, and they can take down the ropes. But these guys are running with no lights. And sure enough, they come flying through. They hit the ropes. It all gets tangled in the prop. They're still trying to move, and the ropes are just getting pulled in, sucked into the prop, and they're slowing down, slowing down, slowing down, slowing down. And they figure, we've got them. And so they take off, the boat patrol does, uh, and they expect they're going to catch up to them soon. Uh, and they're still bouncing through waves, trying to catch up. Uh, and what ends up happening is Lawrence jumps uh, onto the smuggler's boat. But unfortunately for Lawrence, they're ready for him. They beat him with clubs, they beat him with bottles, uh, and then they throw him overboard. Uh, it's pitch black. Yes, uh, Midget's got some running lights, but they can't search the entire lake. And he's just fortunate that when he's coming back, about to abandon the search for his uh, uh, co-worker, <laughs> that there he is, popping, he's bobbing away in the water. He's wearing his life jacket. It's the only thing that saved his life. If he hadn't worn his life jacket, he would have never been recovered. Another one uh, is a gun battle that takes place. 
Uh, and this is one that uh, starts uh, in the Broad Lake, right off in Burlington. Uh, and they're shooting back and forth. Uh, and at some point, uh, this Lawrence Babcock falls overboard. Not sure exactly when it happens, um, but it's out in the Broad Lake somewhere. The next morning, uh, not only did the boat patrolmen go out to try to search for their coworker, but so does almost every commercial operator on Lake Champlain that has a small boat. All the tugs, the ferries, and guess who else is out there? The smugglers. It's a community. They still feel like there's some connections to them. There are hundreds of boats that are looking for his body, but it was never found. There's just too much water. There's too many opportunities in all the bays on Lake Champlain. Um, there's no way that 16 men can possibly stop the flood of alcohol. With organized crime, with a network that had developed over uh, essentially a decade, uh, nothing was going to stem the tide of the alcohol. There was still a great desire, and in many cases, there was more people drinking during Prohibition than before uh, in most communities. More alcohol was consumed per person in the United States during Prohibition than any time in its history. Uh, so it's just impossible to stem this tide. And so it becomes quite clear to many people in the Champlain Valley that this effort is a dismal failure, uh, one that they will not support, uh, one that um, they acknowledge that uh, needs to come to an end. Pressure is placed upon um, politicians uh, to bring it to a close. It's starting to split communities, split families, uh, and uh, it's one thing that they would just like to see go away. Uh, it's a black eye. And this doubtful behavior starts also transitioning people from recognizing federal and state and municipal laws as being something you must follow to being something, eh, I'll follow these, but that one I don't like. So we get to the point where we start to question our, the authority of those who are making laws. And there's a ramification that comes with this. Uh, and it's a, it's a moral and social one uh, that comes to our communities and families. Uh, and you know, it also, there's doubt on the intent of our law enforcement. Are they looking out for us or are they not? Are they just upholding laws which may not actually um, benefit us in any way? And so again, there's all this questioning which never occurred in the 19th century but starts to appear as part of kind of an American identity uh, in the 20th century. Prohibition finally comes to an end in 1933. Uh, and immediate sales, I mean immediate, uh, the minute uh, it's over with, uh, the alcohol comes out of the back room, comes right to the front, uh, and the beer and uh, spirits and wine start to flow. Uh, and it's not just in New York City, like this paper and others uh, highlight, but it's all throughout uh, North America. Uh, everybody seems to be celebrating, except for one group, Quebec. <laughs> the manufacturers are like, ugh, oh no. <laughs> so within months, there'll be manufacturers in the United States, and we're going to lose our market share. Uh, and they're right. Immediately, there's a decline in the amount of uh, alcohol produced in Quebec and also the amount of alcohol that's being sold by those that are bringing it from the Caribbean that are selling it on the coast. Um, in terms of uh, this willingness to break laws, we can still see that today. Um, there is still smuggling happening in the Champlain Valley uh, that happens every single week. We don't hear much about it, um, but just talk to someone who works uh, on uh, the border and every single week there's someone they capture uh, who is trying to transport uh, either people uh, or goods across the border in one direction or another. If you want to learn more about this, I would suggest three resources. Two that are up here that are published books, long since out of print, and the third, just go to the newspapers. You can find them online, go to Chronicling America, it's a Library of Congress website, and just start searching for, through the papers. Uh, of the 1920s uh, and early 1930s. Every day, you can sit there and you can read all the events uh, that are taking place. 
And on page three is the lake section of the Burlington Free Press. <laughs> I read every single one of them. Uh, but not for this project. I looked for material about the canal boats. I wish I had taken note of the material that dealt with prohibition, but I didn't at the time. Um, but now the search is a lot easier. I did it on microfilm. You can do it on the computer, uh, right from your comfort of your own home. Uh, and that's a terrific resource. And some also of the court records are becoming available through the state archives of Vermont as well. Um, New York is still holding uh, tight on to its court records, but Vermont is trying to make those available to the public. Uh, those are two great resources. So. And one other thing to note before I go uh, is if you haven't been to the, uh, to the Granite Museum recently, you need to get there, because Chris Miller is nearing completion of the statue that's going on the State House Dome and it's supposed to be put up there on November 14th on the dome, and he has been literally working himself to death lately. Uh, he just worked uh, a 20 hour work day uh, yesterday. Uh, and he's, gonna, he's destined to try to get this done as uh, best he can. Uh, and it's an amazing sight. And this piece is gonna last, I bet 160 years before that'll have to be replaced on the dome. Uh, the last two lasted 80 years each, and they're made out of pine, uh, and they were covered with white lead paint, uh, and it wasn't well maintained. This is made out of mahogany, rot resistant, tropical wood. Uh, it's going to be coated with a oil base uh, stain, and so that's going to allow deep penetration. Uh, and we have one thing that we haven't had up until about 10 years ago, and that is drones. The drone will be able to be flown right around this every single uh, year, and they can detect any issue so it can be repaired uh, and dealt with immediately. Uh, so this is going to be uh, amazing sights to see. So, um, so. Are there any questions? Yeah. I just have a story oh. about 25 or 30 years ago before my mother-in-law died who lived in Burlington and they, her family had a camp on Bells Bay. And she tells the story. I finally, she didn't like boats very much, but I took her out one day, out to the Broad Lake from Bells Bay, and she told me the story about um, when she was a girl, she used to go out with her father mm -hmm. on Sunday afternoon or Sunday evenings and he some rum runner yep. um, and get the new supply of booze. Yep. <laughs> and uh, blow me away. <laughs> she was a very popular. <laughs> yep. Um, you know, so there's a yeah. good story. <laughs> yeah. Yes, uh, I've always been puzzled about its longest notch. And the geography of that doesn't seem to fit in with your thesis. So Smuggler's Notch uh, was used for cattle. So they drive the cattle up and over the mountain. Because otherwise, you'd have to go all the way up to Morrisville and follow essentially what is Route 15 today. Why is that smuggling? So they were taking uh, the cattle to the British soldiers across the border during the War of 1812. That's definitely smuggling. You're taking it to the enemy. <laughs> Not good. <laughs> yeah. Yep. I think I've got this right. Um, there was a, uh, a newspaper column published, you know, in the 20s and 30s by a cockroach who did his thing by bouncing around on the keys. At least Archie that was the story. The Archie in the Hitabel. You yeah. remember it, okay? And uh, uh, it was written by Don Marquis, actually. But, uh, okay. One of the, when Prohibition ended, there was a column written by Archie Prohibition is over, and a lot of patriotic Americans are trying to drink the country back into prosperity. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> yes. Uh, would you comment <clears throat> on the role of women in their opposition to drinking the period? So the temperance societies, although organized uh, temperance societies uh, came to an end at the beginning of Prohibition, Women still in church and communities uh, tried to stem the tide of alcohol being consumed in town. And so they often uh, would point out to people at church uh, who had um, been caught uh, drinking alcohol. Uh, and those are the stories I find in the newspapers every once in a while. And the, uh, usually it's the gossip column section within the newspapers. So 
Um, women working uh, about their thoughts of alcohol and, and drunken men who sometimes uh, try to get scandal with children or something. Exactly. Yep. I mean, they have really good arguments. You know, they write speeches and uh, and they would take some of the old speeches that were done by temperance societies going back to the 18 teens, and they'd kind of rely, put life back into those speeches during prohibition as well. So, yeah. A nice job, by the way. Yeah, you're welcome. I was on Lake Willoughby, and there were students on the backside. There's some caves. Uh huh. They said the room were Oh, I don't doubt it. Uh, you know, there's places where they would stash the material and just keep right on going, and then someone else would pick it up and take it to another destination. There's some good stories that you can find uh, on the rum running through the land uh, in those books I just showed you. Uh, and you know, one talks about a rum runner that goes all the way from, I think it's Newport, and travels all the way through Montpelier and gets to Barry, and their intent is to sell it within central Vermont, um, but they get a flat tire right in front of the police station in Barry. <laughs> Uh, <laughs> the, first state, the only state capital without a speakeasy, do you think? Oh, there's definitely places that you could have picked up alcohol in Montpelier. Had to be around Montpelier someplace. But again, the speakeasies weren't like the ones in New York, where you'd have you know, bands playing, things like that. Instead, for Vermont and the Champlain Valley, you have places like Cedar Beach, which is now a you know, great big community of people with camps who were constructed in the 1920s through the 1940s. They're all log cabins. And then you've got Mallet's Bay, all the cabins that were constructed there. Uh, and you can look at some of the posters uh, of that era of artists that were coming here, singers. Uh, it's amazing. It's like all the jazz singers. Uh, you have also plays. There was a beautiful playhouse uh, that was built uh, in Morseville. Uh, and uh, today it's still standing. It's a big old barn that they converted uh, during Prohibition. And they would take and bring plays from Broadway up to Morrisville, they do portions of the play, test everything out on the stage there before taking it to Broadway. There are that many tourists coming up here to drink alcohol and enjoy themselves during the summer. It's just, it boggles the mind. So Basin Harbor Club, it's been around since 1911. Basin Harbor Club and others were really, really strategic uh, locations. They're right on the lake. They could get the alcohol, they could serve their, uh, their visitors uh, the things that they needed, so. Was this kind of stuff going on also at uh, Men for Magi? It was, definitely. Yes, Newport and is definitely one of those locations. Now, any place that's got a uh, nice, easy transportation route that's easy to evade. Uh, there was no boat patrol on Men for Magog, but you did have your customs agent there. You had also your border patrol, and they were supposed to be uh, executing the federal laws, but they frequently just turned a blind eye. So, yeah. Uh, isn't this how the Kennedys made their money? It is. Yes. Uh, <laughs> it definitely is. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Now, there were a lot of people that were investing in plantations uh, in the Caribbean uh, and manufacturing facilities, and uh, they were operated by folks from places like New England. They would go to the Caribbean, uh, and uh, you know, they created the network. Um, they had the business ties, they had the social elites who wanted the alcohol, wanted a consistent uh, supply line, uh, and so the Kennedys and others would be more than willing to provide that. So. Yeah. We had a band director, Dean Merrill, who's from Barry a long time ago, and his sister worked in the garage in Barry where they modified cars. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah. Oil onto a hot engine. Uh -huh. Create clouds of smoke. Yep. So when they would meet the booze coming down from the monasteries in Canada, that's right. By the Black River, they would drive on back roads, and if anybody was following them, they could do this and create clouds of smoke. <laughs> They do that. They'd also throw out spikes, uh, so throw out nails and things like that on the road right behind them. All the tires are balloon tires for the 1920s and early 30s. So they're like a bicycle tire. They pop very, very easily. It doesn't take a lot of effort. Uh, and once you pop a tire, they're done. So they're not going anywhere. So. Uh, speakeasy in Barry. Once Prohibition ended, he told me that it moved up to the Canadian border, and nobody knows exactly uh, what they're doing up there. Uh, where uh, was it, Barry? I don't know where it was uh, in Barry. 
<laughs> well, I know that for Barry, since you have a large Italian uh, population at the time that's in fact moving to uh, Barry at that time, during, the, during Prohibition, um, they were unwilling to give up um, their wine and their, their homemade grappa. And so what they did is they uh, would get uh, rail car loads of grapes that would come from central New York. And they'd get several of them from August right through till now into October, the end of the grape season. And uh, families would go down and they'd get crates and crates of grapes. And remember, they were allowed to make 200 gallons uh, at home production. But in many cases, they made far more than 200 gallons and shared it with other community members um, beyond just uh, the, those in Barry and Montpelier. <laughs> so make a little extra money. So. I guess I'm feeling funny about the male, female, us and them in the um, prohibition concept. I read a little history about women um, being asked to take a shot before quilting gatherings. <laughs> And maybe you have some I don't have any history about that. <laughs> <laughs> That's cool. Vermont, I don't know. Yeah. You know the temperance societies, you're right. They weren't all just women. It was um, men and women that were members of the temperance society. And even in, during Prohibition, there were some ministers that uh, you know, tried to convince their congregation that they needed to take and follow the federal laws. Uh, and. Uh, um, their attempt was largely in vain. So. You mentioned the congregational uh, church. Is, is, were any of the leaders of this temple yeah. stuff? Or? Some of them were. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, congregational church, uh, were they tied directly to the temperance uh, societies? And that is true. Uh, so many of uh, you know, the churches in the state of Vermont during the 19, or 1820s and 30s were congregationalist. Uh, and so they. Uh, frequently are the ones who are starting the temperance societies and they start spreading uh, going from church to church to church uh, and what they're doing is they're giving uh, speeches about the uh, about temperance and the value it is to individuals and to society uh, and that's how it spreads so. um, I grew up in Maine and Neil Dow was a congregational minister who started many of the temperance societies in Maine and one of the one of the issues for the for the women in Maine anyway was the um, was spouse abuse, yeah. and um, it started as I mean that was one of the issues right. that became important for the women in the temperance societies. One quick point about your uh, your slide about in industrial alcohol. Yeah. I mean, there's wood alcohol. It, it, it's, I know this because laboratories can get pure grade alcohol right. uh, for uh, so that they're it's not adulterated with with methanol, but it's not it's not the ethanol in that. Uh, in, in the other stuff, that's the, the, the high uh, proof alcohol, but it is adulterated slightly with with methanol, and that's what makes people go deadly. Wild. It's actually pure grain alcohol. Uh, it, it, it doesn't. And the other thing is, there are states in this country where you can now get pure grain, or and have been able to for years, get pure grain alcohol with a revenue stamp on it. In, 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 I mean, it's hilarious because in Knoxville, Tennessee, you can get, uh, and because and, uh, I've actually bought it, uh, the, the next uh, uh, county over Blunt County is is is, is dry. dry. You can't get you, you can't get even beer on a Sunday. Uh, <laughs> it's hilarious because we, we took a friend who's German out for a pizza at the airport. And the airport is actually in, in Blunt County, and, and he wanted the beer. And it was on a Sunday, and and, and, he's, and no. he gave us his little like, What's wrong with you? But then he had us over for Christmas, and and, and he had this bottle of PGA, and I'd never seen. PGA before, and he you know, got it from, yep. from a liquor store in, in, uh, in Knoxville, and I actually bought a bottle of the stuff, and it comes with a great big label on it that tells you, you can't drink this straight out. Exactly. Of and it's, well, it's extremely dehydrating, yeah. and, 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 and it just burns like crazy, and you have to, you're supposed to have to mix it with, with fruit juice or water or something, but of course, since yeah. I bought it to soup up the oh. Oh boy. <laughs> it really is extremely burning 
Yeah. Uh, because it's very dehydrated. Uh -huh. okay. well, thank you, right. everybody. If you have any other questions or comments, probably stop. Yep. Thank you.